Today we are looking at researching a descriptive text. Uh, you're going to use secondary sources. A secondary source is something like a book or the internet uh, that gathers together information. We're going to identify the main features and we're going to begin to use descriptive language. So, what story did we begin to read yesterday? We started to read Viking Boy by Tony Bradman and we've heard the introduction and the first chapter. Can you tell me five things that have happened so far? Pause the video and have a little think. Here's the five things that I came up with. One, Gunnar heard some horses. Two, he went home to tell his father, Bjorn. Three, Scully came to warn the village about raiders. Four, there was a feast. Five, Scully offered Bjorn a place by his side, but Bjorn refused. So that's what we've got so far. Let's find out what happens next. Scully and his men left the next morning. In the days that followed, father arranged for guards to be posted, the men of the farm taking it in turns to keep watch. But nothing happened, and after a while Gunnar forgot Scully's warning, until one night when he woke with the smell of smoke in his nostrils. It always smelled of smoke inside the longhouse, but they usually let the hearth fire burn down at night, and the smell shouldn't have been so strong. There was a little light coming from the fire's embers, and Gunnar could make out the shapes of sleeping servants around the hearth. He slid out from beneath his furs, raised his eyes, and his heart jumped. A tongue of flame was licking at the underside of the thatch, tendrils of smoke curling from it like snakes. Father! Mother! Wake up! Gunnar yelled, yanking back the curtains to their chamber. The roof is on fire! His parents were soon out of bed and looking up at the flames, the servants waking too and crowding around them. What do you want us to do? said Arna, appearing from the shadows. Get everybody outside, said father, then start filling pots with water. We can probably save most of the roof if we get it damped down. Arna started pushing everyone towards the porch. He unbarred the door and opened it, but he didn't get far. Gunnar heard a humming sound and Arna grunted falling back into the arms of the people behind him. Arna was dead, three arrows in his chest, a dark blood stain spreading across his tunic. Gunnar felt sick, hardly able to believe what he was seeing. Father stepped over Arna's body, slammed the door shut and banged the bar down into place again. He quickly moved to one of the small windows in the wall, pulled open the shutters a crack and peered out. More arrows thunked into the wood of the longhouse. Who brings fire in the night and murder to my hall? He roared. There was no answer for a moment. Gunnar glanced up and saw the flames spreading. His mother grabbed him and moved him towards another window, then turned to him with a finger across her lips and carefully pulled the shutters open. We are the wolf men. Bring us a fire and slaughter. A voice outside growled at last, and we will give you a choice of endings. Gunnar peered through the window and felt his blood go cold. A line of fierce-looking warriors stood facing the longhouse beneath the star-filled sky. There were perhaps thirty of them, most wearing leather jerkins, only a few in chainmail, but they all wore wolf's head helmets and carried spears decorated with wolf tails and shields painted with pictures of snarling wolves. Several held torches, the flames casting shadows that danced and three had war bows, arrows notched and ready to be fired. There were dogs too, five massive beasts straining at their leashes, their jaws parted to reveal white fangs, their wild eyes reflecting the red light of the torches. Another man stood in front of the line, and Gunnar realised he was the one who had spoken, their chief. 
He wore a male shirt, but his head was bare, his grey streaked black hair hanging to his shoulders. He wore a long wolfskin cloak, and the blade of his unsheathed sword glinted in the starlight. A couple of wolfmen with torches moved up beside him. A choice, said father. That's generous of you, but I'm sure I can guess what it is. Stay in here and burn, or come out with my gold and silver and anything else worth stealing. Then you'll cut my throat anyway, and probably kill everybody else too, or sell them as slaves, which is worse. I can see now how this works, said the chief, but we're not as bad as that. I'll let the women and children and servants live. Maybe only sell a few. Maybe we'll even let you fight for your life. We could do with some fun, I let's. His men laughed and yelled their wild war whoops and howled like wolves. Your night guard wasn't much of a challenge. The chief nodded and another of his men threw something onto the ground. It rolled slowly towards the longhouse and Gunnar realised it was Ranulf's head, the eyes wide open, the hair darkened with blood. Glad to hear you'll give me a chance, said father. I'll think about it. Don't think too long, said the chief. I can be very impatient. Gunnar saw him nod, and the two men beside him ran forward and threw their torches high into the air. The flames flapped and hissed as the torches spun end over end and thumped onto the roof, and the wolfmen cheered. Mother hurried over to father with Gunnar. What are we going to do? she said. We don't have much time. The roof isn't going to last long. As if to underscore her words, one of the roof beams groaned and crashed down in a shower of sparks. Everyone ducked, and the longhouse filled with acrid smoke and small floating pieces of burning thatch. Father pulled his wife and son closer to him. I can't save everybody, he whispered, his face anguished. You two have to come first. So he turned to the others and spoke loudly so they could hear him above the sound of the flames. It looks like we have no choice. Out you go, quickly now. He didn't wait to see whether they obeyed him, but hurried his wife and son back to the curtained off chamber. I think we can make a hole in the wall here, father said. Help me. He pushed hard at one part of the wall, and Gunnar and mother pushed too. Soon the turves were loosening. We'll need to be ready. Put on some warm clothes, but nothing that will stop you running. We'll make for the forest. Gunnar and Mother busied themselves with finding clothes and pulling on boots. We're ready, said Mother at last. She glanced up and Gunnar followed her gaze. The fire had reached the thatch above them and smoke billowed through the curtains. Father had pulled on a thick tunic and strapped his sword to his hip. Here we go, he said, giving the wall a kick. The curve shifted and buckled then collapsed, folding in of themselves and a hole appeared. Come on, Gunnar, said Mother. They rushed out together and straight into one of the wolfmen. To me, lads, he yelled. I've got a couple here. Suddenly, Gunnar heard a hissing sound and saw a bright gleam sweep clean through the raider's neck. Gunnar blinked with the speed of it, then saw the wolfman's head bounce away across the grass. The man's body seemed to realise something final had occurred and slowly crumpled to the ground. Father stepped over the corpse. Deathbringer shining in his hand. Behind him the flames from the burning longhouse leapt into the sky. That's for Arna, he hissed. He turned to Gunnar and Mother. Run! It was too late. Gunnar heard snarling and saw the dogs come racing round one end of the longhouse, followed by a dozen wolfmen. Father took the shield of the man he had killed. Mother grabbed the spear from the dead man's hand and they both turned to face the onslaught. Gunnar picked up a rock from the ground and stood between them, wishing he had a better weapon. The first of the raiders reached them and also raised his spear, but father brushed it aside with the shield and let the man run onto Deathbringer, the blade piercing through him. Father yanked Deathbringer out of his guts. And that's for Ranulf, he hissed, seeking out the next opponent. Two more wolfmen and the first of the dogs attacked together. Father took one warrior low, Deathbringer slicing through his legs and the other high with a stroke that almost severed the man's spear arm, finishing both with thrusts into their chests. Mother dealt with the dog, skewering the snarling animal on her spear as it leapt, the other skidding to a halt just out of range, 
growling and showing their fangs. The rest of the warriors stopped, spreading to form a circle round Gunnar and his parents. Gunnar could see the archers among them, arrows notched in their bows. Father stood before his wife and son, covering them with the shield, watching the wolfmen. Gunnar's heart pounded as if it were about to burst through his ribs. All three panted in ragged gasps, their breath a cloud in the cold night air. Why have they stopped? whispered Mother. They're waiting for me, said a deep voice. Suddenly, two more men appeared and walked into the circle. Gunnar saw that one was the wolfmen's chief, but then he drew in his breath sharply. The other was Scully. So far in the story, all of the action has taken place in Gunnar's village. What sorts of things have you heard about that you might see in the village? What sorts of things do you think you might also see? So think about a Viking village. What sorts of things are going to be there? So I had to think, and these are the things that I came up with that you might find in a Viking village. Houses. Most importantly, people need somewhere to live. So there's going to be houses. A great hall, sometimes called a long house. And this is similar to the Mead Hall that we learned about when we were studying Beowulf. Somewhere where perhaps the chief of the village lives and where people gather for feasts and things like that. A blacksmith. You need a blacksmith to make all your metal things. Funnily enough, in Viking times, we well, we think of blacksmiths as making swords and things like that. But actually, their biggest job was making nails to build boats because you need a, need a lot of nails to build a boat. And blacksmiths would spend a lot of time making nails, which isn't so exciting as swords, but just as important. A well, you might need a well to get some water from. A fence or a wall to defend the village. Vegetable gardens, people would grow vegetables to eat. Um, they could well be by their houses in the village. Animals. People would be keeping animals and often they would be kept in the village so they didn't wander off, I guess. Boats. Um, I think this village is by the water, so there would probably, probably be boats. So using the internet, I want you to research what, it, what you could find in a typical Viking village. Um, there should be lots of sort of sources of what a Viking village could look like. Um, so search around, do, do an image search, um, search using you know Viking village, key stage two or KS2, Viking village for kids, that kind of thing. And you should find a fair bit of information about what you might find in a Viking village. So have a look, make a list of things and then come back to the lesson. So I have drawn my Viking village and I would like you to draw yours. Um, as you can see, I've included lots of those things that were on my list, but I have not put any labels on it yet. So draw your village, but do not add labels. That's important. When you've done that, come back to the video. Right. What is a noun phrase? That question isn't just coming out of nowhere. There's a reason for it. What is a noun phrase? Well, a noun is a name word or the name of a thing. And a phrase is a number of words put together. Hmm. So a noun phrase contains a noun and the words that help describe it. For example, Gunner's dog. So the dog is the noun. And the fact that it belongs to Gunner is the bit that's describing it. The blacksmith's anvil. So the anvil belongs to the blacksmith. The dry thatched roof. So now we're using adjectives. 
dry and thatched are telling us about that roof. The fearsome gates. Helga's room. The last house. So it just makes our descriptions more detailed. We could have just said the dog, the anvil, the roof, the gates, the room and the house. But we've added that extra information to make these noun phrases. Um, so the person reading it has a better idea of what it is that we're writing about. So what I'd like to do is label your picture of the village using noun phrases. I'll show you mine now. So I have got the busy boatyard, the chief's magnificent longhouse, well-tended vegetables, the blacksmith's forge, the deep grey well, the imposing wooden gates, gently mooing cows, smelly drying fish, well-used nets and the cold icy fjord. A fjord is a, um, a flooded valley that flows into the sea. So what would happen is glaciers would come down the valley, glaciers would melt and sea would fill the gap. And there are lots and lots of them on the coast of Norway, which is where some of these Vikings would have been coming from. So get those pictures done and get those labels on there and I'll see you tomorrow.